Mom, you are taking forever. What parent isn't familiar with this refrain? Time is an interesting thing, isn't it? Sometimes it flies, sometimes it crawls, and it all depends on the perspective of the person who experiences it. Which is why a conversation that seems quick and lively to a parent will seem to crawl to a child. Since the perception of time is so dependent upon our circumstances, it's very hard to wait on someone else's timing. And it is even harder when the person that we're talking about is not a person at all, but God, for whom a thousand days, years is as a day, and a, thousand, and a day is as a thousand years. Clearly, God's timing is different than our sense of it. So that would make it even harder to wait on the timing of someone who is immortal. Which brings us to our story of Abraham today. Now, when we left off last week, if you were with us, or a refresher if you weren't, we were standing in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, who had eaten the fruit from the one tree forbidden to them. A promising beginning which was spoiled when the first people rebelled upwards and decided to try to become like gods themselves rather than relying on the God who was their creator. And as the wind blew through the trees in the garden, the first people hid from God because they were ashamed. And there we left them, cowering as they awaited God's response to what they had done. And all through Genesis chapters 1 through 11, the story is the same. That same story repeats itself. God creates and humanity rebels. One writer says it this way. In Genesis 1 to 11, the set for God's action is the whole world. All creation, including but not limited to humanity, is declared good in Genesis 1. But as a result of violence mainly human violence, God generates a flood to wipe away the wickedness and violence. And so Genesis 6 through 8 is almost kind of a divine do-over. But of course, everything is not erased. Noah, his family, and the representative animals connect the past to the future. It seems that human beings always rebel against God. But then... We come to Genesis chapter 12, and the story moves away from the perspective of the whole world, and it zooms in on one man and his family. That man is Abraham. So instead of pondering the wickedness and the violence of human beings, that as God realizes is not going to go away, and instead of trying to work for blessing the whole world through humanity in general, God takes a new approach in Genesis 12, working through some particular individuals to bless all the families of the earth. Now that might be a strange idea for most of us to uh, think about, but it's something that God recreates and does again in the incarnation of Jesus. So in a nutshell, the story that we had between Adam and Eve and Abraham is one of human rebellion. But when God calls Abraham, or Abram as he's known at this point in the story, this initiates a radical new development. God acts in history to set in motion a series of events that will ultimately heal the breach that sin has placed between God and the world. So before we get to our reading in Genesis 15 today, we need to note a few things about the history of Abraham, or Abram. It's called both, and I'm going to use both kind of interchangeably, and even though he becomes known as Abraham a little later. First of all, we should know that this encounter that God and Abram have in Scripture that we read about this morning is not the first time that Abram meets God. That relationship has been in place since Genesis 12. So first of all, God chooses Abram in, Ge in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Then God saves Abram from Egypt, and Abram worships God. And when God first calls Abram, he says, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And God attaches a promise to this call. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. 
I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And when Abram receives that call to go and then that promise from God, scripture simply tells us that he went. So that's in Genesis chapter 12. So Genesis chapter 15 can't also be heard apart from Genesis 13 and 14. So in Genesis 13, Abram, who took his nephew Lot with him, divided the land with Lot. And he let Lot choose which land he wanted. And Lot took the land that's described in many ways similar to the Garden of Eden. But the uh, land that Abram gets is described only as being the land of the Canaanites. So it's already inhabited. And in chapter 14, Abram rescues his nephew Lot and defeats a particular king. And that leads the king of Sodom to come and offer Abram riches from his conquest. But Abram announces that he will take nothing. So in both of these stories, Abram has the possibility of securing his future. In the first story with land, that is good. And in the second story with riches, but instead of taking these opportunities to secure his own future, Abram says that his future can only be secured by the Lord Most High. So when God called Abram to leave his land, he went. And he turned down possibilities from dealing with his nephew Lot and dealing with the surrounding leaders of the region to secure his own future. So he's put all of his eggs in one basket, so to speak. He's put his future completely in the hands of God. But waiting on someone else's timing is hard. And it's even harder to wait on someone else's timing when the other party is the everlasting God. And that's what Abram's been doing all of these years since God's voice first told him to abandon everything he knew and to go to the land that God would show him. And despite going as God had asked him to, Abram is no closer to God's promise of having enough children to become a great nation. Abram doesn't even have one child at this point. So that voice, since he called Abram to go, has been surprisingly hard to come by in the years since he pulled up stakes and moved. Someone once commented, the following, God is often subtle to a fault. Or in the words of one writer, the Abram whom God told to leave his home has been by turns faithful and faithless, bold and cowardly along the way, and yet God has apparently remained silent ever since issuing that command. What's more, while God also promised to make Abram and Sarai into a great nation, God hasn't even given them one child. So it's easy to imagine Abram and Sarai longing for God to say something to keep them going. And yet they learn that all too often, God seems silent, inactive, and thus inattentive. So for Abram, who's received this promise from the lips of God, his present circumstance mocks that promise. One writer says, for Abram and Sarah then, who'd left behind everything familiar in order to step into God's promised future, the continued barrenness of their situation mocked their hope. And that's the situation that Abram's in when we get to today's reading. God has promised Abram something, but God's promises look empty in the face of barrenness and hopelessness. And so when God first talks to Abram in our story, he starts out saying, fear not. But Abram responds, you have given me no son. You have not kept your promises. So what are some things in your life that are hopes and fears? What promises have you clung to that have been broken? Is there anywhere in your life that you would say was a place of barrenness or disappointment for you? What present reality keeps you from being able to hope for the future? Because it's not just Abram, of course. There are people everywhere for whom the future looks empty. 
And our present reality has a way of overwhelming future hope. And the promises of God too often remain just that, promises. And so if anything in Abram's situation has described you at some time in your life or describes you today, then maybe we can look to the rest of Abraham's story. And maybe it can give us hope or courage. So we've said even though Abraham refused to take the best land from his nephew Lot, agreeing instead to take the already inhabited parcel of land that Lot refused, and even though Abraham has declined to receive any payment from the king of Sodom, and both of these he did, we can infer because he trusted in the promise of God, the fact is that God's promise is taking a really long time to come to pass. A very long time. And there's still no hope of it on the horizon at this point. So it's really not surprising at all that when God finally breaks God's silence, tapping Abraham on the shoulder once again, Abraham has a hard time believing God's new, but now so very old promise. God has promised to give Abraham many descendants, and since God hasn't kept God's promise to him, in the meantime, Abram has taken things into his own hands. He updated his will and made his servant his heir. Abram has adopted someone to share his very great reward with. After all, that is the logical thing to do. So Abram became very pragmatic. He chose to believe the old adage, which I'm going to mention at this point is nowhere found in Scripture, that God helps those who help themselves. You will not find it. And so with no children, and with time ticking away for himself and for his wife, Abram decides to make his servant Eliezer of Damascus his heir. Sometimes God takes what seems too long in keeping God's promises. And so it's tempting occasionally to assume that we need to take things into our own hands, whether that's financially or with the relationships that we're in, or even spiritually. Maybe that's something you can reflect upon this week. When God seems to be taking a long time in fulfilling something that you thought would happen, how often do you take matters into your own hands? Have you ever done this? What was the result? So in Genesis 15, God finally speaks to Abraham once again. And this is what he said. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. So when God finally speaks to Abraham again, Abram takes this as an occasion to burst out against God with the question that must have been weighing on him, at least since chapter 12, what about those kids you promised me? You have given me no offspring, and a slave born in my house is to be my heir. So Abraham fires back a question to God's voice, a concern or even a complaint. We don't know because we don't know the tone of voice he used from what we read, but he seems to say, God, May I remind you that you still haven't done what you said you were going to do. Now, very often people of faith are taught that if they question God, this means they don't have enough faith. But that isn't always the pattern that we see in Scripture. In the Bible, we see that people quite often wrestle with God. They challenge God. They ask God for reassurances and tokens that they're on the right track. One writer says this, Abram must have some level of faith to even register disappointment that God has not yet done what God said God would do. That is, Abram expects and believes that God's word, and that's why he speaks to God in this way. Sometimes the most pious position a person can assume is the one that stands before the world as it is stands up before the face of God and says, No, this I will not accept. This is not right. And God knows that better than anyone. 
So have you ever been afraid to question God or his ways? We're taught that to believe in God means that we accept and we don't ask and we wait for the things in God's time and we don't challenge and we don't ask for signs and we don't ask for reassurance. But here, Abram is doing just that. And no bolt of lightning from heaven takes him out. Abraham is asking for a sign. He wants something concrete. And our omnipotent, abundant, extravagant, loving God brims over with excitement and says, Oh, Abram, you want a covenant? You got it. Watch this. So after many, many years, the word of the Lord comes to Abram once again, and Abram fires back a question concerning the promise he received but had never been paid out on. And the truth is that even after Abram's life draws to a close, after everything is said and done, we still find Abraham waiting on God's promise. We still find that Abraham is forced to trust in God's timing all throughout his life. Even to the end of his story, the promise is something that's a little bit elusive for him. It's hinted at, but it's still not very close. The New Testament book of Hebrews puts it this way. By faith, Abram, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as, does, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was unable to bear children because she considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. All these people were living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. So even after God comes to Abraham again, God does not rush order the promise that he first made. When God promised Abram and Sarai a bunch of children, they probably expected a house full of them right away. But all they got to the end of their lives was only one child, Isaac. And only much later would there be more descendants. It took millennia for God to give Abram as many children as the stars. God, in fact, is still adding stars to Abram's family constellation to this day. However, despite the fact that Abraham only ever saw the promise and welcomed it from a distance, our reading ends with the following little gem of a verse which gets repeated and amplified in the New Testament and becomes for the Apostle Paul a verse so packed with import that it's quoted in two New Testament passages as a linchpin for understanding the relationship between faith and works. In Genesis 15, 6, we read, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So this little verse shows up in the New Testament a number of times. But how do we understand it? What does it mean to be credited with righteousness? Now, if righteousness is conceived, as we often think of it, as a conformity to some sort of abstract moral code, then this is really hard for us to understand. However, righteousness in the Bible, and many commentators pointed this out, is faithfulness to a relationship. So a person's righteousness in relationship to God is fulfilled when we have faith in that relationship. We might ask ourselves this question, when does Abram turn from his questioning? When does Abram stop being a fearful skeptic and become someone who, as it says in verse 6, believes God? It would have shocked Genesis' original audience to learn that God as this narrator says, graciously credits faith to Abraham as righteousness. 
Now, to be credited means putting money in someone's account, essentially. And yet righteousness is a little bit more of an elusive term. Citizens of the 21st century might argue that being righteous is basically being a nice person. But to be righteous in the sense that we read about it here is to trust the future God has planned enough to quit trying to control our present. Now we know what happens in our present shapes our future, and so when the present becomes problematic, we worry about the future. Our faith sometimes shrinks in the face of loneliness or fear and grief that seems stronger than God. Our faith sometimes wilts in the hothouse of illness and financial uncertainty that appears to dictate our future. Yet to be righteous means to trust that God, not what's happening today, not what happened in the past, God will ultimately control our future. Or as the Heidelberg Catechism states, to be righteous is to have good confidence for our future in our faithful God and Father. So to be righteous is to trust God, to be faithful to our relationship, even when the promises that we've received are far off. Now we might do well to note that even though Genesis 15, 6 says Abram was credited as righteous, he doesn't perform flawlessly throughout the rest of his life. He and Sarai are still pragmatic. They still take matters into their own hands. They try and use Sarah's slave, Hagar, to try and fulfill God's promise to them, since God doesn't really seem to be getting on with it, even after this encounter with Abraham. But after Abraham questions God for the ways in which his present reality is not living up to the promises he received, God, in characteristic fashion, does something very interesting. God decides to up the ante. Abraham already has heard that he's supposed to become a great nation. And now God tells him to go outside, to look up and to count the stars if he can, because that's how great in number his offspring will be. So when Abraham very naturally grumbles to God that he hasn't even begun to fulfill the first promise that he received, God makes the promise even bigger. Double or nothing, God says to Abraham in so many words. One writer says this, The Lord took Abraham outside, pointed to the sky, and urged him to count the stars. That's how many children you'll have. Clearly, this promise had the long view in focus. With the passing of generations, the descendants of Abraham and Sarah would number in the thousands or even the millions. How like God, when the promise is hardest to believe, God ups the ante. And so it happens that the story that we have shifts from Abraham, of course, to looking at God, because only God could, could fulfill such a lofty promise. The end of our text directs our focus away from Abraham to the living God. Trust that draws from human effort or example very quickly goes bankrupt. The only way for trust to flourish is to keep our eyes firmly fixed on God through the power of the Holy Spirit. His newfound belief that God is God can only be a great gift from God. The God who makes the promise of countless children to Abram is the God who also makes that promise believable to him. The God who later raises Jesus Christ to life is the same God who raises Abram's dying faith to life. Look up in the sky, God urges Abraham. Keep your eyes fixed on me, urges God, because that's the only way to trust God, despite the fact that sometimes his promises seem to take forever. It's only God who can raise our dying faith to life. So, in your opinion, what are God's most precious promises? Is it God's promise to never abandon his people? Or to be the God who looks after our children when we're gone? Or to bend every knee in worship of Jesus Christ? Or to establish God's control over all of creation? 
Sometimes the fulfillment of these precious promises seems almost hopelessly delayed. Because even Christians feel like they walk through crises alone. Our children sometimes turn their backs on God. Whole swaths of the world stubbornly resist Christ's lordship. And sometimes God's most precious promises seem far off, almost mocked by the reality in which we live today. The story of Abraham, which is a radical new development in which God acts in history to set in motion a series of events that will ultimately heal the breach that sin has placed between God and the world, that story ultimately ends with Jesus. So when God promises this to Abraham, he really is taking a very long view of things. So what do we do in the meantime? when we're waiting on the timing of everlasting God, do we have enough faith to be disappointed in the way things are right now? Do we trust God enough that we can sometimes challenge him, even as Abraham does here? And finally, do we have that kind of righteousness that Abram demonstrates, to trust that it's God, not our present, not our past, that holds our future? Do we have the kind of faith that allows us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on God through the power of the Holy Spirit? Look up in the sky. Remember the radical promises of God and believe. Would you pray with me as we close this morning? God of the covenant, as you promised Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars, you have also promised us that we might live under those stars as your people, faithful and loved. Show us how to do that, how to live as your people, and how to nurture all your children with whom we share the same canopy of sky night after night. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.